Good morning. It, it, we're in a kind of funny time of year, aren't we? When like Christmas, we know it wasn't long ago, and yet it, it feels like it was ages ago. And blah, blah, blah. anyway, I'm sure you know you. Most of us spent uh, much of Christmas catching up with various people, you know, friends and family. And if we're honest with ourselves, the reality is that we would have probably been more eager to catch up with some people than we would have been with others. Either sometimes we just actually don't know these people very well. Maybe um, they, they are pretty distant relations or, or we just used to know them well. We kind of don't know them anymore that, that well. Or, or sometimes we, we do know them pretty well and we're just not that keen to hang out with them. The truth is it's actually only natural that we are most excited about spending time with those we're closest to, those that we know the most and love the most. So even in a kind of a normal week, I can go a few days when it feels like I don't really see my wife much. And, you know, we might kind of pass like ships in the night, we're getting on with craziness of life, but that actually get to hang out. And so I love the chance for an evening in together. I just love hanging out. I am most eager to see her and to see my kids more than anyone else because I know them the best and I love them the most. You don't have to tell me essentially to spend time with my wife and and to communicate with my wife. Now I'm sure, <laughs> granted, I there are ways I could learn how to do that better and be better at communicating, but I don't so much have to focus on why I do it because I know her and, and I know I want to spend time with her. And relationships with family or friends, even marriages, ultimately dry up when communication dries up. And, and if we, we don't see someone for a long time, that is when that relationship dries up. I, I am so excited that we are doing a series, preaching series, looking at the Lord's Prayer. We called it Teach Us to Pray. Every one of us can all learn a little bit more on how to pray. Maybe you've never prayed before. You basically never pray. Maybe you prayed every day for decades. We can all learn a little bit more. And as we do this series, I, I want to be believing God for big things this year. I want to be believing for him to move in significant ways. And big things won't happen if we are not praying. So it's just great to be looking in how we can pray and, and how to pray. Foundational to praying is getting to know who you are praying to. The very beginning of learning how to pray is learning who we pray to. There's a study done um, almost exactly two years ago in the UK. It found that 51% of Brits would say that they are prayers. They, they pray occasionally. The truth is that the vast majority of those people have got no idea who they're praying to. Learning who we are praying to when we pray, that is what is going to lead us to praying and wanting to learn how to pray more and indeed have greater faith in our prayers. As Christians, we're not praying to some distant relative, distant deity that we hardly know or someone that we know a lot about, we know them well, and we know that we don't want to spend time with them, we pray to our Father in heaven. We can know him intimately, more so than we could ever imagine, and he is more amazing and powerful than we could ever get our heads around. And the more we know him, the more we will want to spend time with him, just like those that we love the most. That's why the Lord's Prayer starts with addressing our God as our Father in heaven. Because it reminds us how close we are to him, we're his children as, as Christians, and how amazing he is. And what we're going to be doing every week between now and basically Easter, we're going to be doing this, this little sheet, which you've got one this week, you're going to put it in the Watsons to help fuel your prayers. Now, it is up to, do, up to you what you do with this. It's going to have something, some things to pray into um, and, and why we're praying into that. It, it would be just amazing if you, you took this and used it. You know, didn't just leave it on your seat, but just took it and gave 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 2 minutes every day 
to praying through the things that we're going to be putting on these sheets. We're going to have lots of things to pray into, lots of things to pray for. And I think it would just really help to fuel our faith, fuel our belief in God if we take these and together we corporately join in praying for whatever it is we're praying for that week or that day. As we try and raise our faith and raise our expectation for what God can do through us. So let me encourage you, you, you know, it's up to you what you do with it. Let's, let's use these as little resources to help us together as Grace Church, as God's family, to be seeking him and believing him for more. Today, we're looking at what it means to address God as our Father in heaven. Why the Lord's Prayer starts with that, how that helps us in learning to pray. Let me read it. Let me read the the Lord's Prayer from from Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says this, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's significant that in in teaching us how to pray, Jesus says we should start by focusing not on ourselves, but on God, our Father in heaven. How we start our prayers, that's the foundation that we build our prayers on. So it's important that we build the, the right foundations and so that the rest of our prayers are, are built on those good foundations. We need to know who we are praying to and we need to start our prayers by focusing on him. If you were to look at the Lord's Prayer as like a formula, which it kind of is, then the first half is given to focusing totally on God and on his will. Jesus is encouraging us to to lift our eyes off of ourselves and to look to him. That might seem pretty obvious that when we're praying, generally our prayers should be God-focused much more than they are man-focused. It can seem kind of uh, pretty obvious, but actually the difference is huge in praying prayers that are just focused on him than than prayers that are focused on us and our own situations. What happens, this is why I think, what happens when we spend um, our prayers starting with ourselves and then just kind of bringing our things and focusing on us is that actually that can often lead to increased anxiety rather than decreased. You come kind of with these things, you present them before God and you go away just thinking, oh, even worse. Because we, we, we focus further in on our problems and as we do that, they become bigger, not smaller. So these were actually maybe molehills become mountains. But if we start with and focus on God and who he is, and not so much on our our own things that we've got to bring to God, then that will lead to certainly a decreased anxiety. That leads to peace and a better perspective. We focus in on God and we realize that our Problems become smaller as he becomes bigger, and what may be mountains become molehills. So it's good to start our prayers by focusing on God and not us. But even then, Jesus doesn't just say we should come and say, God, or even you know, sovereign Lord, mighty God, majestic creator of the ends of the earth, merciful, merciful Savior. Now, all of those are they're good, they're good ways to address. God, that is who God is, but it's not how Jesus instructs us to primarily address God in prayer. This is how, that's how Jews would approach God, that with, with lofty terms. And if you read the Old Testament, actually never once in the Old Testament do the Israelites pray to God as Father. Even, even though he was, he was the father of Israel, as it says multiple times, no one ever prayed to him as father and approached him in that way. As Christians, we are in the new covenant. We have the outrageous privilege of coming to God as our father. It's, it's a unique privilege to us. 
And so God is our father. We are adopted as his children. There's a sense in which God is the father of all people. He, he created everyone. Everyone is made in his image. It's kind of similar to the way, I don't know, Steve Jobs is the father of Apple. God is the father of all. But ultimately, truly, he is only really the father of those who have been adopted as his children. He is only the father of Christians. Who, Christians are the only people who can call God our father. And the fact that Jesus instructs us to approach God in prayer as our father, it kind of communicates two amazing things to us, which we'll look at a bit more. Firstly, God is closer than you think, and God is holier than you think. He is closer than you think, he is holier than you think. He is your father, who is more intimate and close to you than, than any of us can get our heads around, and he is holier and greater than any of us realize. He is both intimacy and supreme majesty. So let's unpack those two things. Kind of our father is more intimate than we know, who is in heaven. He's more holy than we know. I understand that for many, uh, many of us, when we think about God as our father, we've actually had a pretty negative experience of father. And so it's difficult. For some, you know, we've we, we got great dads. And to think of God being like our father is, is amazing. But for some to relate God to our fathers doesn't, doesn't make us want to know God more, or quite the opposite. Just three things to say if you struggle with that. Firstly, there is no earthly father who can truly show us what our heavenly father is like. No earthly father does. But with that the case, it's still true that every single one of us, whatever our earthly dad is like, has access through Jesus to fully knowing what our perfect father is like. Secondly, God's character, it's not like his character is determined by the quality of our dads. Our dads may not have been very good dads, but that does not mean that God is not good. And thirdly, if you do struggle, it's true for all of us, but particularly if you struggle with the concept of God as your father, then it's helpful to get your image of God the father from Jesus and not your own dad. Jesus said in, in John, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So you want to see what the Father's like? Look to Jesus. Don't, don't worry about your own dad. Look to Jesus. So what does it mean when we say oh, God, is, God is our Father? It is ultimately saying that God is like a, an amazing earthly father, but just better in every way. So a few things. Our Father means that he loves us more than we think. Good fathers love their children more than their children realize. I'm sure my own kids, they've got, they've got no idea how much I love them. I know that I say I love you and they, I know they just can't grasp the extent to which that is true. To be honest, I'm even surprised. I cannot believe the extent to which I love them. It's beyond what I can understand. So I've got... Maya, who is a four-month-old baby, she offers me nothing, right? Like, she poos and she eats and she sleeps. She does smile, actually, now, which is, which is lovely, but doesn't do a great deal. And yet, I, you know, I come home from work or whatever, I, I see her, I pick her up, and I just, oh, I love you so much. I, I cannot express how much I love her. God loves us more than we think. That is how God feels about you. You offer him nothing particularly. It's not because you deserve it, but he loves you way more than you know. I heard once a preacher called PJ Smythe was talking about something he says to his own children. And, he, and you know, sometimes when they have not had great behavior or if you know, any time really, he'll get them along, alongside and say to them, hey, remember... Daddy loves you when you're good. Daddy loves you when you're naughty. Daddy loves you all the time. And it's amazing. I've stolen it from my own kids, naturally. And I, I say to them, hey, just remember, sometimes they've been naughty. I just say, remember, Daddy loves you when you're good. Daddy loves you when you're naughty. Daddy loves you all the time. It is totally true of our Father to us. 
He loves us all the time. Not because of anything we do or don't do. He just loves us more than we realize. Even to this extent, think about this. God the Father loves you with just as much love as he loves his own son, Jesus. He loves us, his adopted children, just like he loves his own son, Jesus. Jesus prays to his father in, in John 17, 23, and he says to, to his father, the world will know that you send me and have loved me, loved them, I'm talking about us, even as you have loved me. God, the Father, loves us just as he loves God the Son. There's no way that we can be dislodged from the family. We can never leave this family. God loves us more than we think. More than that, he delights in us. I used to, when, um, I remember when my oldest, Zeph, who his middle name is Isaac, Zeph and Isaac, when he was a baby, I, when, I don't know when he was like, I was getting him changed or whatever, I used to sing this song to him and sing, Zeph and Isaac, you're the cutest Zeph and Isaac in the world. I don't know if <laughs> you picked up, it's to the tune of Bob the Builder, I, I don't know why that was. But it just came to me and I used to just sing this song, Zeph and Isaac. I used to love, and anyone who disagreed just was wrong, right? He is the cutest thing, he still is, he is the most precious and delightful thing in the world. You disagree, you're wrong. The Bible says that God does that over us. In what's been, been called the John 3.16 of the Old Testament, in Zephaniah 3.17, it says, He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. God sings over you. He delights in you. He spends time boring the angels by showing them pictures of you on his iPhone, like we do. And, and, and like I'm boring you with stories of my own children. And I'm not done yet. I've got plenty more. God delights in us. He delights in spending time with us. Sometimes I've got multiple children vying for my attention. And I, and I, I just can't cope. I've got, I've got no idea how school teachers do it. But I, I, I can't do it. Maybe it, I've got two going at a time. Maybe I've just got one and I'm busy doing something unimportant and, and I can't give my attention to them. God is different. You know, God listens to our prayers like we are the only ones praying. You effectively have his undivided attention whenever you want it because he delights in you. He delights in spending time with you. God the Father loves us all equally and perfectly. The, the, the prayer says, our Father in heaven. It is a corporate thing. It's one of the great things that we do this thing, praying through this term and together with these sheets. We join together. We say, our Father, we join as the family. And God loves us all equally. I think in a weird way, this can almost be harder to grasp than the fact that he loves us as much as he loves Jesus. Because we can look at people and think, there's just no way God could love me as much as he loves. That person's amazing. God, God must love that person so much. Or on the flip side, we can look at people who we just really think, how can God love that person as much as he loves me? We can just struggle with these things. The other day, Zeph, we were driving somewhere. He asked me and Liz who we love the most out of our children. And he he was determined to get an answer. Like, he determined to say, no, 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 but who do you love? And I understand that he can't comprehend the answer. It is a fair question, but and I just say, we just, I know it's hard to get your head around, and um, you're all different in your own way, but we just love you. We don't love any one of you more than any of the others. We, we just love you all so much. It, we, we cannot get our heads around it either. We, we're all different, but God loves us individually all the same. He provides for us without question, and he knows what we need. After teaching his disciples to pray, Jesus goes on to highlight. He says, hey, check out the birds of the air. Look at, look at the grass of the fields. Look at them. And do, you know, next time you're on a walk, look at the birds here. Look at the grass of the field. Look at them. See how they're provided for. Can you see how they've got everything they need? They're not worrying about anything. God provides for them 
like that. He gives them everything they need. And he loves us, like we're saying. How much more can we be sure that he's going to provide for us? We don't need to be anxious in our praying. I understand we've got our anxieties in bringing them to God. We don't need to be anxious because we pray to our perfect Father who provides for our every need and we can trust him to do so. Importantly, crucially, God has a better understanding of our need than we do because he is God and, and we're not, right? It's like children who, who don't understand what they need like their parents do. And there's a song in um, Matilda the Musical which illustrates this. So it's about school children singing about what life will be like when they're grown-ups. It goes like this. And when I grow up, I will eat sweets every day on the way to work and I will go to bed late every night and I will wake up when the sun comes up and I will watch cartoons until my eyes go square and I won't care cos I'll be all grown up when I grow up. And there goes on. I feel like I'm singing quite a lot, but there you are. I'm sure you're enjoying it. I'm sure you are. It's this great song, and it's saying, yeah, when kids, we've got no idea. We think we know what we need, and you grow up and think, actually, I, I couldn't comprehend it when I was a child. Just like that with us and God. As we pray, sometimes we, we cannot get our heads around. We cannot understand why God doesn't give us what we're asking for. It seems like a perfectly reasonable thing. He's a good father. Why isn't he doing it? But that, that, that's what good fathers do, right? They, they give their children what they need and, and they hold back from things which they might want but they know are not going to do them any good. Our Father protects us and comforts us. Now, this doesn't mean life is easy, but it means that he is with us even when it isn't. I'm sure I even go as far as saying God causes some of our difficulty but we're, we're just too short-sighted to understand why on earth he would do that. And, and again, it's the same as the Matilda song. It's the same principle. I'm sure my own children would say, oh, I am the direct cause of some of their suffering when I just don't do what they want me to do. And, but they don't understand that I'm doing it out of love for them. With God as our Father, we don't need to fear anything. When we do, he comforts us like any good earthly father does. When we suffer, he comforts us. The other day, I had a bit of a shocker. I, I put Maya down on the bed, in, um, and I put her next to the iPad, which was on kind of a stand thing, and so it was like perched up like that, and you know, I didn't think anything of it. And she obviously, like a baby, wear, like just waves her arms all over the place. And then there's one of those kind of slow motion moments where I saw she just kind of clipped the iPad and it like was next to her and it went and then like just smacked her in the face. She obviously starts bursting into tears and, and crying her eyes out. But but I, I pick her up, right? And I and I hold her as close as possible and I say, it's okay, don't worry, it's daddy's here. It is okay. God loves to comfort us when we are struggling. It says in two Corinthians one, three to five. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. So some of, I think some of our greatest intimacies when, with God come when life is tough, but we just know his closeness to us. When in all suffering, we know that he takes us and he holds us and he carries us home. One more, our Father, it shows us that he feels pain when we abandon him. He is the prodigal God. So when his children wonder, he hurts. He is desperate for their return. If you've got children who have kind of gone astray and gone on a path that, that, that is difficult for you to watch, you know that. You know how that hurts. God is like that. He's embarrassingly passionate about relationship with us. And he cares when we go astray. Do you know there's no other religious system that talks about God like this? About a God who loves us that much, who protects us, who sings over us, comforts us, calls us his children. 
He is closer, more intimate, more in love, more protective than we realize. So we should come to him more readily. We should come to him more eagerly because he is so much more amazing and so much closer than we think. And we should also come to him with more awe and humility because he is our father in heaven. He's closer than we think and he is also holier than we think. Now, when we say our father in heaven, we're not really referring to his address. It's not like he is God in heaven, like I am Joe in heaven. It it tells us something about him and his nature. The psalmist says, our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. The fact that he does whatever he pleases flows on from the fact that he is in heaven. The power flows on from the fact that he's in heaven. God is in heaven. We are on earth. That is simple and yet very profound. The words in heaven, they're supposed to kind of put us in our place, give us awe and reverence. They, they help prevent us from taking ourselves too seriously in any way and, and in prayer and also in not taking our heavenly father seriously enough. He is in heaven. We need to take him seriously. He's also limitless. He is in heaven, but in fact, even the heavens can't contain him. As it says in 1 Kings, Solomon prays, the heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. Job says, I know you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Thwarted is such a great word. No plan of God's can be thwarted. This has got huge implications for how we pray, right? All the things that that hold us back and that we mean we can't do things, they do not hold him back. He is limitless in power and ability to provide and answer our prayers. There's loads of times, I'm going to get loads of times when I want to be able to help my children, but I'm genuinely powerless to do so. You know, if they're poorly, I want to make them better. I just can't, can't do it, even if I want. Obviously, I want to. A good exa- so often it comes to breakfast time and, you know, the whole like you get to it, you realise you haven't got any milk or you haven't got enough milk. Often like we've got enough milk to maybe give them the cereal, but they also like to, to have a drink of milk with their breakfast. And sometimes we might not have enough for that. And th- they, they call it milk in a cup. And I'll say, oh, sorry, we, here's your cereal, but we, can't, we haven't got any, um, we can't have any milk in a cup this morning. I say, no, I want milk in a cup. I was, I'm sorry, I'm going, I want milk in a cup. Where's the milk in a cup? And, and they can't comprehend that I'm just powerless to do anything about it. Our Father in heaven is, is never in that position, right? He, he never wishes he's able to help, but just can't. My hands are tied. He is limitless. So we, we can pray big prayers, right? There's no prayer too big or bold to ask of him. We can believe him for big things. As we pray together, as we join together in praying, I can, I can believe in few huge things. He is limitless. Let me encourage you to expand what you're praying for. Whatever it is you're praying for now, why don't you just broaden it, make, make it bigger. There's no, there's no reason for you to limit your prayers to anything. Nothing happens to us that he does not have total control over. He is limitless. Also, he's not our servant. God is more intimate than we think, yes, but we should never become over-familiar with God or presume on him. His grace is, is limitless, but we can't you know, snap our fingers at our Heavenly Father. That is not how it works. It's not like he's some wealthy dad that loves to spoil his kids and give him whatever they want. No, he's not our servant that he should be at our beck and call whenever we want him. We serve him, not the other way around. He is independent of anyone else. So while we are totally and utterly dependent on him, he is totally independent. Acts 17, 24, 25 says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. Does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Everything that exists, exists because God created it. We are all 
totally and utterly dependent on him for life and breath. He, in contrast, depends on no one and needs no one. We're like a baby to a, to a mother. A baby needs its mother's milk. Babies are totally dependent on its parents in order to stay alive. The, the parents aren't dependent on the baby to be kept alive. They love the baby, but they don't need the baby to be alive. We are totally dependent on God. He is not dependent on anyone or anything. He is unfathomable. <laughs> he is unfathomable. Now, it's not unknowable, but we can't comprehend him. He is incomprehensible. We can know God more than we think. He is closer than we, than we think, but we can never figure him out. He, he's not a formula or equation which is complicated, but if you devote your life to study, you might get your head around him. No, no, he, he is totally unfathomable. He is holier, more set apart, more different, more amazing, more beautiful than we can understand. And we can know him intimately as our Father. In heaven, yes, but still our perfect Father. The more we get to know this Father in heaven, the more eager we will be to come and spend time with him and pray in the first place. And the more we approach him as our Father in heaven, the better our prayers will be. He's not some distant relative that we hardly know. He is close. It's not, it's not wrong to, to address God as majestic God or, or Holy Spirit as we pray, but the main way we should relate to him in prayer is as our Father who, who is in heaven, who is indeed holier, more majestic than we realize, but also so much closer and more intimate than we know. When you pray, spend time starting by worshipping God for who he is as our Father in heaven. Spend time in that. Ultimately, when we pray, our Father in heaven, those four simple words, really we're praying the entire gospel message. Because the only way we have any right to pray like that is because of what Christ the Son has done for us. One more way, just as I land, one more way that our Heavenly Father is like great earthly fathers, but better, is that he is willing to sacrifice for us. In the Old Testament, there's a, there's a story of King David and his son Absalom. And Absalom, his son, has declared war against his own dad. Now, naturally, David is deeply grieved by this. It's difficult for him. And in the end, Absalom is killed. David wins. And even though Absalom was in total rebellion against him, David is distraught. He cries out, oh, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Good earthly fathers are willing to sacrifice for their children, willing to give up anything for the sake of their children, even when they're in rebellion. And when you look at the New Testament, when we see Jesus the Son praying to God the Father, every time he addresses God in prayer, he addresses him as Father. He comes to him as Father. Apart from one single occasion, and that is on the cross where Jesus took the punishment that our sin deserved. That's where he cried out and addressed God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the only time he didn't call God Father was when God the Son was forsaken by God the Father. And that was so we could always call God Father and that we would never be forsaken by him. Christ died for us while we were still sinners in rebellion against God. And it is only because of the cross that we can pray our Father in heaven and have such audacity to do so and even come with confidence. And it's only because of the cross that we can know God and that he is always closer than we think. It's at the cross that all God's love, all his fatherly characteristics are summed up. That's where he proves to us that he loves us more than we think, that he delights in us, sings over us, that he provides for us, that he protects and comforts, that he feels pain when we abandon, and that he is willing to sacrifice for us. 
He is holier than we think. He is also closer than we think. That is who we are praying to and how Jesus instructs us to start our prayers by lifting our eyes off of ourselves and fixing them on God, on our Father in heaven who has done all that for us and and worshipping him for that in our prayers. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.